Hey, this is Jamie from Stonemeyer Games, and for today's uh, long-form video, I'm going to do something a little bit different, slightly different format. I want to talk about catch-up mechanisms in tabletop games, and I, as I do with many of these questions, I asked Stonemeyer ambassadors to name their favorite catch-up mechanism and why. And many of them gave just such wonderful, thorough answers that I thought that instead of ranking these or ranking the games that have catch-up mechanisms, I would just go down the list and share. Um, the many different unique catch-up mechanisms mentioned by ambassadors here, because really they, they gave such wonderful details here. So this is mostly going to be an alphabetical list about catch-up mechanisms. I have a few visual examples, but most of them I'm going to be reading off a, a screen behind this camera right now. So let's see, the first one is a game that I haven't played. It's After the Empire. They say it has a great system where the more gold, which is the same as victory points in this game, the more gold you have, the harder invaders attack your castle. This works thematically very well and makes catching up easier. That's really clever. I like that. So if you've earned more victory points over the course of the game, you become more of a target for the AI that all players are fighting against in the game, which, yeah, that, that's, that's really, really clever. I haven't played that yet. Australia is the next one. I have played Australia. It says... Uh, they say, well, technically not a catch-up mechanism. I love the way that player turns work. The player last on the time board goes first, even if that means multiple actions. Yeah, I guess this is, I hadn't thought about this as a catch-up mechanism. We'll see if someone mentions Tokaido later. But the idea of a one-way action selection track, um, where if you fall behind in time a little bit, if you're spending time more conservatively, then you can catch up by taking multiple turns. And I guess that does work with these games. So if someone jumps way ahead to grab something they really like on a one-way action selection track, that might be great for them. And you might feel like you have to then catch up, um, but you have more actions than to catch up usually in those style of, that style of game. I can definitely see that in Australia. Barrage is a game that I haven't played. They say, uh, many games have the rule that whoever is furthest behind becomes the first player in the next round. Um, yeah, I, I, I could totally see that. Yeah, so I, that's what they're saying in Barrage. So if you are furthest behind in points, you get priority in the next round. You become the, the first player, giving you priority um, in, in the following round. So that's a very simple way to do it if you have a game that's uh, structured into rounds. Let's see, Baseball Highlights 2045. I haven't played this one either. It's called a visitor save mechanism. Um, the odds against it being successful, so the winning team still wins more often than not, but gives the opportunity for a big, exciting play at the end of the game. You know, that I, I, I wish they had described the mechanism itself a little bit more in detail because I don't know how it works here, but I'm guessing it ties into the thematic mechanism of a save in baseball where you can uh, save the game or maybe have a brilliant comeback at the, at the end of the game. Maybe someone can talk about this in the comments a little bit. What exactly the catch-up mechanism is as it relates to the visitor save mechanism in Baseball Highlights 2045. Here's a Kalis example, Kalis 1303 specifically. They say, I, li I like the Provost because it's not an obvious shoehorned catch-up mechanism, but it does allow for a little bit of attack the leader. The players know it's all there and know it's always there, and just the thought of it can, can keep you from going to a more valuable spot. So the Provost in Kalis, as I recall, is a, a token that you can place and if you place that token, uh, based on where you place the, place the token on the kind of the road in Kalis, it can make some actions irrelevant. Um, like you just don't get those actions. And I hadn't actually thought about that in Kalis as a catch up mechanism, but you're totally right. Uh, I think the danger of the Provost is that you can use it throughout the game, not just when you're behind, but also when you're ahead. So you could um, hurt someone if they, if they get, uh, whether or not they're ahead or behind. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's, it definitely can be used as a catch-up mechanism as well, a direct player interaction. Codenames and Azul, where if someone rushes out to an early lead, they end up narrowing down their options later. I think this is really, really interesting, really an interesting example, especially for codenames. Because in codenames, if you rush out to an early lead, you have eliminated cards that your opponent would otherwise have to deal with when they're providing uh, clues to, to, their, to the players on their team. Uh, and so, yeah, this is a really great example here of a, of a clever, fully integrated catch-up mechanism in that you're, you, by narrowing down the options for the opponent and you doing well, having you doing well early in the game, you are helping them uh, with the problem that they are trying to solve throughout the game. Um, a really great example, I, I think, works for, for code names. maybe less so for Azul, but definitely for code names. A lot of people mentioned Dominion as a catch-up mechanism here. 
and they specifically in reference to how victory points i do have dominion here how victory points clog up your deck so if you get victory points in dominion and that kind of means you're in the lead in terms of points they have they have clogged your deck those victory point cards aren't worth anything for most of them at least for uh, on-game engine building or in-game engine building uh, so if you do pull ahead and you you grab a few of the the big victory point cards you you are slowing down your ability to actually do better in the game as it stands for the next couple of turns because you're clogging your deck yeah so the mini i can see why a bunch of people mentioned that as a great catch-up mechanism eclipse comes up here uh, they say the increased cost of running a large empire the more influence this the player has uh, which is most likely tied to how well they're doing in the game, the more it costs to run their empire and the more they have to stress on how many actions they can take per turn. Uh, and they mentioned Suburbia as another game that does this as well. And yeah, I think that's a wonderful example. I've only played Eclipse once, but I but I love that example of how like the more influence you've spread across the galaxy, so you control more things, you have more power. Um, I think also the more income you're getting by doing that, but it also means the more you have to pay every round as a result of, of having such a big empire. Uh, I think that's a great example of the catch-up mechanism. Um, Flamme Rouge. Yeah, okay, this is a great one in, in, uh, in a racing game. In Flamme Rouge, the slipstream mechanism gives you free movement if you're trailing behind other players. And this ties really thematically to what you're actually doing if, you, if you're in a bicycle race because you can use... Um, you can get behind someone and use less energy basically to pedal because they are they are of the slipstream of, of the air current coming from that player in front of you and so I, I yeah definitely I can see how this if you're if you're trailing a little bit in Flamme Rouge you can you can use that slipstream to catch up to the players ahead of you and this can happen throughout the game so it's kind of a back and forth throughout the game where you're where you're you might be using one player and then they might use you to catch up later on in the game uh, let's see, Horizon Zero Dawn. I've not played this. The player in last at the end of the round draws a sabotage card. Um, it says most of this game is played open face as it's semi-cooperative, and that makes the presence of a single hidden card striking and unnerving. They're also rather well designed, enabling judicious play to reap many rewards. Yeah, so that's interesting. Again, another game, another example of if a game is structured into rounds, that if you are at the, you can always have a reminder where you look at the player who's in last place at the end of any given round and they can get a special bonus like this sabotage card in horizon zero dawn uh this is out of top uh, uh alphabetical order but someone mentions tapestry here one of our games tapestry i missed this while preparing for this video but at tapestry they say uh they they like that um Points are summed after every era. Okay, that's interesting. That that you most of the points that you get in tapestry you gain as you pass out of your current era, and so you can kind of you you don't ever well you can feel like that you're falling behind, but um, but you can you can always have a visible uh, a visible uh, aspect of, of where the other players are in the game at any given time. But also, what they didn't mention is that in tapestry, if you are not optimized as well as other players so you're you have fewer resources usually that means that your turns uh your each of your rounds it's, it's not exactly a round game but each of your your turns the number of turns before you take an income turn are fewer but if you are the first to pass uh, first of your neighbors to pass into a new era you get a resource bonus so the, this is a definitely a balancing mechanism in the game and, and a catch-up mechanism where if you are passing more quickly into the next era, you're getting those bonus resources to help you uh, have a longer era and have better engine building uh, the next time than for the next era. So that that is definitely a, a catch-up mechanism in tapestry. Um, let's see. This player called uh, has sees it in Seven Wonders Duel. Okay, so. Um, it, it's a it kind of a, they call it hope of winning. I'm going to call this an instant win condition. So in Seven Wonders Duel, if you are quite a few points behind, so the normal end game condition is that you play three rounds in Seven Wonders Duel, you win based on points. But there are instant win conditions in Seven Wonders Duel. I'm going to do a video about instant win conditions soon. That means you can uh, focus on a different instant win condition in Seven Wonders Duel that's either military or science. So even if you fall behind on points. Uh, a catch-up mechanism is essentially, uh, I'm going to go after this instant win condition instead. I'm going to ignore points from now on, or not entirely give up on it, but partially give up on it and go after this other instant win condition. Definitely a uh, catch-up mechanism for, for games like Seven Wonders Duel. 
Um, a number of people mentioned Isle of Sky. And Isle of Sky does have a great catch-up mechanism in which, uh, you know, I should have pulled a player mat out of here, but at, on, in, the, uh, in the board on the middle of the table, you get coins for every token on the victory point track that is ahead of yours. And the number of coins that you're getting depends on the round. So I think in the, uh, maybe the third round, you get one coin or two coins for every token that's ahead of you. And then that scales up to even three or four coins in the later rounds. So this is, I, I think this is a fantastic catch up mechanism. It can actually lead you to strategically not getting points early in the game so that when you start to get to those rounds where you get extra coins, you can jump ahead of the other players uh, so it, it ties into the strategy a little bit, but mostly it's just, here's a little extra thing to make you feel better, even though you've fallen behind a little bit in Isle of Sky. A lot of people gave that example, and I think for good reason. So it's a great catch-up mechanism. Uh, let's see, in Munchkin, they say, In Munchkin, I've always liked how the super strong monsters won't fight low-level players. They provide the high-level players with a good challenge while not beating down players lagging behind while they're down. That sounds awesome. Yeah, that sounds a little bit like the after the empire mechanism. Maybe the, almost the opposite of it. Uh, in this case, that uh, if they're super strong monsters, they're just going to ignore the weaker players instead of picking on them, which I think is fantastic. In the kids game, Gulo Gulo, I've not played this game. If someone is in front, they can only go forward a space or two at a time, while players who are behind can leap forward to catch up. So giving players different uh, movement mechanisms based on where they are in the game, which actually makes me think of one of my favorite video games, Mario Kart 64, which is that if you are farther behind in Mario Kart 64, you have greater odds of getting powerful boosts whenever you get uh, the a little the bonus boxes, the question mark boxes, you have a, a much better odds of getting a powerful boost that can help you catch up. Whereas if you are in the front, you have much lower odds of getting those powerful uh those more powerful uh, one-time benefits that you can get from those those uh, power up, I think they're called yeah power up boxes. Um, so that, that's a um, perhaps a controversial element in Mario Kart 64, but I always found it fun. Kemet Kemet comes up here. The lowest victory points gets to pick turn order. And Kemet, the lowest victory points gets to pick turn order. Yeah, it's been a while since I played Kemet. I'm really looking forward to getting the the new Kickstarter version from uh, from Matigo. But yeah, I, the, the again, looking at your current victory points each round, and you get a benefit based on that. And I, I actually really like this in Kemet that you actually get to pick your turn order. It's not automatic because going last in Kemet can actually be really advantageous. Going first might be able to might be important for you at certain points, but. Um, and in Kemet, you're not only picking your turn order, turn order, you're picking the turn order for all players. Um, and so, yeah, that is a powerful benefit to get if you are further behind in victory points in Kemet. Definitely a catch-up mechanism. In Odin's Ravens, this player, I have not played this game, the player mentions the Loki cards. They say, uh, in the game, you have the choice of drawing land cards or Loki cards. Land cards advance you. Loki cards allow you to affect the racetrack. As such, if you fall behind, you can choose to draw more of the Loki cards, which give you the capability to change the path ahead, not just to benefit yourself, to also interfere with the opposing player. There's a little bit like that Kalis catch-up mechanism a little bit, in that uh, if, you are, if you're farther behind, you have a way to mess with the other players a little bit more, to slow them down a little bit. And I think the key there is that you don't, uh, you don't have the ability to completely mess with their plans, but, um, but you do have a, a, a more powerful ways of, of messing with the, those other players a little bit. Because I don't think, it, I think one of the problems with catch-up mechanisms often is that they completely slow down the, the players who are in first place, even though they deserve to be in first place. They have played better than you in many of these games. If there's a lot of agency in this game, they've played better than you and maybe deserve to be there and don't deserve to completely be, be messed with. That's my opinion. Um, someone mentions patchwork. Let's see what they have to say about patchwork's catch-up mechanism. Uh, the, again, they talk about time tracks here. The further back on patchwork on the time track, um, the uh, the you get to take an action. So yeah, I can I can see this again. That uh, it does tie a little bit. Being further back on the time track doesn't necessarily mean that you are further back in terms of the goal of filling up your patchwork quilt in patchwork. But I can see that being a, a catch-up mechanism. Yeah. A couple of people mentioned Power Grid. A bunch of people mentioned Power Grid. Being last means that you get to buy resources first. And someone else says it another way. Uh, I love the way that the last player gets to pick first on, on houses on the market and on buying resources from the market. Uh, uh, placing houses on the board and buying resources from the market. So yeah, Power Grid plays with turn order a lot in ways that can definitely impact 
uh, your ability to progress in the game and can therefore help players that are lagging behind a little bit. Uh, someone else mentions here, out of, out of alphabetical order, Carson City. Losing duels gives you more strength towards further duels and means you can still place that worker in another round, which is fantastic. And yeah, I, it's been a while since I played Carson City, but I can definitely see that. Where if you do something in the game that pushes you back, so if you if you lose a duel, um, then you actually get better at future duels. It's like you've learned from your mistake and you get, you get better at, at duels in the future. A bunch of people continue to mention Power Grid, and here's a big one. A lot of people mention the Rat Tails in Quacks of Quinlanburg. Um, this is a huge part of the game, where if you fall behind, you look at the victory point track, and there are these little rat tails built into the victory point track. And for every rat tail between you and the player in first place, you get, uh, you get to automatically advance, automatically but temporarily advance on your, your potion track. Um, for, for the upcoming round. And uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a big catch up mechanism in Quacks. And uh, I, I think, let's see, I think most people seem to, be, seem to like this mechanism. I think that's why they've ranked it here as their favorite catch up mecha mechanism. So when people, like 25 people mentioned this as a, more than that, maybe 30 people mentioned this as a, their favorite catch up mechanism. And then oh, someone mentions here that it's very easy to remember as well. Um, and I like that it's temporary. It's a temporary boost. It, it isn't for the rest of the game, even though if you continue to lag behind, you'll continue to get that rat tail bonus. But, um, but I like that it's a temporary boost. It's built into the victory point track. It's very easy to remember because it's, there's a reminder on, on the, uh, on, on the kind of the, the phases, the steps that you take at the end of each round, you get a reminder there. And yeah, it works. It lets you feel like you still have a chance in the game, even if you fall pretty far behind, if you haven't been pushing your luck very well and, and quacks of Quenlinburg. Let's see, this is one that I haven't played in a while. Railways of the World. Income decreases past a certain number of victory points. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually really interesting. So in Railways of the World, you scale up to getting really good income. But then once you do that, income actually starts getting worse. And so if you continue to advance in terms of victory points, uh, you, based on what you've done on the board in Railways of the World, your income gets worse. I think this is really, really clever because it feels really good to build up to that great income. And you really don't have a choice but to continue to get points after that, to continue to, to do good things in the game. Uh, but you're going to get less income after that. So players who have maybe been slower to build up, just as you are going downhill in terms of income, they are still going uphill and reaching that apex of income. And they have a chance to catch up at that point. Someone mentioned Res Arcana but doesn't list why. I have played Res Arcana a couple times. I'm not sure, quite sure what, what catch-up mechanism they're referring to in that. So if you have an idea what they're referring to, feel free to mention that in the comments. A few people mentioned Rise of Queensdale um, in that there... Oh yeah, so Rise of Queensdale, there is a campaign track that you're, that you're advancing on. And someone mentions that there's a bigger goal after leveling up. They say... Uh, I really like this one because as you get more powerful, taking bigger steps with each action, you have a longer path to go to get to the next level. Um, it evens the race while also letting players who have, who have achieved a goal still feel a sense of progression. Um, they said, I was able to win the campaign, although another player was perpetually in the lead. And from what I can remember from Rise of Queens, which is a wonderful legacy game, this is essentially a campaign long catch up mechanism where... Uh, you have incremental goals that you need to achieve each game, and those goals get more difficult for you specifically based on how well you are doing in the campaign. So if you are not doing as well, your goals are a lot easier. It's easier for you to get up to that next level, um, whereas it's harder for more play for players who have already uh, moved forward in the game. So I think that is a uh, definitely a, a great example to throw in here in terms of a competitive campaign legacy game in that you want players to feel like they're still in it throughout the entire campaign. Um, Sorcerer City. If you score the least points in a round, you get a tile of that level for free off the top of the deck. They say it's easy, it balances, you get something. Um, they say it can be hard to remember because they left it off the player aid, but which seems like a little bit of a mistake. But yeah, this seems like a great catch-up me mechanism. If you score the least points in a round, you get a tile. And so you're looking at the points earned for that specific round, not just your points for the entire game. You get a tile of that level for free off the top of the stack. Nice little free bonus if you did not do well in that particular round. Um, yeah, I, I really like that. 
Steampunk Rally. Just a few more here at the end. Steampunk Rally. You can blow up your machine to move more and get rid of dead weight. So yeah, if you have fallen behind in Steampunk Rally, you can actually blow up. You can blow up cards um, in your, in your, uh, your uh, I think they're airships that you're creating in Steampunk Rally. You can blow up that part of your ship and, and boost ahead. So you're giving up your engine a little bit to catch up uh, with other players. So I mentioned Suburbia here for the same reason that I mentioned, uh, what was the other game I mentioned earlier? I'll just read it so we can remember. Suburbia, crossing red lines reduces your income and reputation. So a little bit like railways of the world. Uh, since the lines are closer together, higher up on the point track, players who are further ahead are slowed down more. This person says they like it for two reasons. One, it's intuitive and easy. You cross a red line, lower things by one. You get to see it on, the, on your player mat very easily. Also, it's thematic. Of course, as your city grows, there's going to be more administrative overhead and lower income, and it will be more crowded and have aspects that make it less desirable to live in, lower reputation. This makes it a mechanism that's both easy to remember, exceedingly functional, and thematically resonant. Whoever wrote this should do these videos because that's a really excellent description of, uh, of the suburbia catch-up mechanism. Um, a few a bunch of people are listening. Rats of Quedlinburg Qu again. Uh, tiny epic dinosaurs. The more dinosaurs that you add to your ranch, the less resources you produce and the more resources they eat. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. The more, whenever you have like people or anyone who's consuming resources in a game um, and that, that is good for you to win the game, the, the more you have of that, the more resources they are uh, consuming. So this is a catch-up mechanism that's directly related to something that you are doing to win the game, which I think generally works. Every now and then it can feel bad because you're like, oh, I've gotten all these good things and now I have to work even harder to maintain them. Um, this is often a, this is a feeding mechanism in many games. You have more workers and you have to feed them on an ongoing basis, which doesn't always feel good. But maybe in, in Tiny Epic Dinosaurs and, and uh, definitely in uh, Feast for Odin, the game does things to make you feel good, uh, even though you're having to feed. And uh, last, I'll mention this one. I don't know if I'd rank it on a, a, a top mechanisms list, but in Uno, the plus four mechanism. Um, when playing a game with a family and one has called Uno, best way to keep the game going and get you some hope, toss them a plus four card so that they have to actually draw four cards and can't just end the game. I don't know if I'd call that a great catch-up mechanism, but it certainly is a catch-up mechanism in the game Uno. This is a wonderful list. Thank you so much to Some Iron Ambassadors for listing these games and these catch-up mechanisms. Hopefully they've given you some ideas for catch-up mechanisms in games. If you feel like your game needs one, I don't think every game needs one. Again, I think it's important to reward players who have played better and don't punish them for playing better, but also uh, keep put things in the game to keep things a little bit close. And one thing that wasn't mentioned here is games that obstruct victory points from other players. I don't particularly love this, because, especially since players can easily count victory points or can keep track in another way. But um, but there are games like, I think Five Tribes does this. Uh, and again, it kind of almost becomes arduous in a game like Five Tribes because you have these point tokens that you have to keep face down to hide your points from other players. Does it really matter all that much to keep your points hidden? Probably not. Um, but it is something they put in that game. It can be construed as a, a way to prevent the need for a catch-up mechanism because you don't know how the other players are doing in the game. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you have some other favorite catch-up mechanisms or if you have thoughts on catch-up mechanisms in general, feel free to post them in the comments below. Thanks.